Before we start, I'd just like to greet uh, Joseph Batak. Joseph, I haven't seen you uh, for a bit, and it's nice to see you there. You're looking well. I hope all is okay in Manila. Great. Thank you for joining us. And also, as we come together, I'd like to greet Rojan Dahal. Rojan has been writing to me quite, quite graphic messages about the challenges that have been faced in Nepal with trying to reduce spread of COVID whilst at the same time helping people to maintain their, uh, their ability to earn an income. And it's a really tough situation. Uh, Grojan was also telling me that there are challenges with food and also that a lot of children have been brought out of school. Uh, Rojan, how good is your email, uh, is your internet today? Let me just see. Can you, can you, uh, Rojan, are you able to tell me, can you connect? Because if your e internet is working, I'd like to hear from you today. I just want to see, can you unmute? How is it working? Uh, thank you, sir. Yeah. Good morning from Nepal. Yeah. It's, it's afternoon right now. Yeah. So, ah, uh, it's, it's, it's a terrible right now in Nepal in terms of um, the informal sector, I want to say that they are the most who are, uh, I mean, hit hardest by this COVID-19 because as I've said that uh, in developing country like Nepal, India, Bangladesh, majority of the peoples do rely on informal sector. Yeah. So uh, in the past, there, there was a, a depressions, but it did, it doesn't affect, didn't affect to the informal sectors. But now this COVID has enormously affected these uh, sectors. Uh, these are the daily wage worker, small yeah. and middle size businessmen, uh, the, the vegetable seller, all are affected um, Huge by this COVID, and it has directly impact to the child, the pregnant mother, and the right to education of the children because all sort of, of things have been hampered. I'm worried that the children who are out of the schools yeah. uh, may not join because um, these uh, children uh, means means are taken by the factories and all sort of things, and when they get a, uh, survival skills. They may not go back to the school. Yeah. So this is the situation. What I think is that due to this COVID, one decades of a developing country like Nepal has hampered yeah. because it has affected the uh, pregnant mother. It has affected the neonates. Yeah. Uh, it has affected all the um, uh, life cycles of the uh, of the peoples in developing countries. Uh, they don't have that right to have a um, nutrition, proper nutrition, proper food, pro access to health services, yeah. access to uh, vaccinations, which all sort of, of things has hampered. Uh, so it's a critical situation right now. Yeah, okay. Um, I'm going to actually go around several of you now and just get you to make various observations on what's happening where you are. And then I'm going to assemble what, what you tell me into a composite picture uh, during, during the um, briefing. So I'm turning the order around uh, and I'm taking advantage of the fact that I'm in touch with several of you uh, as it is. So if you could just be ready, as Rojan just did, to give us a quick uh, resume of what's happening in your vicinity with COVID, that would be great. I'm super keen in a minute to call on Ian Norton. Uh, I'd like to uh, ask Karen Kaplan, it'll be the middle of her night, but it'd be great to hear from her. Uh, I also want to hear from Rhiannon Osborne, uh, a little bit about what's been going on in Zambia. And if anybody else is ready to talk, just a, a little vignette. Uh, what I'm, I've also got is quite a comprehensive update that I want to give, but I want to hear from you first because I want to put your ideas into my uh, update. Um, please put uh, things into the chat if you want to talk. 
uh, um, uh, and you'll find that um, I'm in the mood to encourage you to really come out with the things that matter to you because what we're seeing all over the world is that there are either the familiar challenges are re-emerging or new challenges are coming out, some of them really serious, particularly in some of the humanitarian hotspots around the world. And I just want to do a, a quick assembly of everything that's happening with you all. Now we're here with Pete Morey. Uh, he's the uh, artist who's joined us. And um, um, here we go. How are things where you are? Thank you, Pete, for hitting it right on the nail. And uh, very, very grateful for you and uh, your colleagues from Live Illustration for all you're doing. I've taken now to sending round the visual stories uh, with, with a lot of my uh, emails and people are saying they find these absolutely fabulous. Let me go to Twee next and just get you Twee to give us your quick, um, quick, uh, Twee, could you just give us the quick survey, please? Sure. So up on your screen now, I've launched the poll. Those of you who aren't familiar with it, there are three questions. The first one, please share where you're joining from. Once you've ticked that, you can scroll down and select your age range. And then the last question is a multiple choice question around how you're feeling today. Uh, so we can feel the mood of the room despite being a virtual conference. Thank you. Back to you, David. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, just to um, add that um, Twee has been helping me a lot uh, with a real challenge that we had with um, some comments that I made being actually misrepresented in the New Zealand media. I've talked about it before on the briefing. This all happened on the 26th of August. And what's been really nice is that a, a journalist called Mark Dolder in, um, in New Zealand uh, actually did a, a quite careful uh, analysis of what I was saying and I'm very very pleased that just now I've got a message from uh, uh, indirect message from Ashley Bloomfield the chief medical officer of New Zealand who has I think found the, uh, the, the, the correction that we did and the restatement of our position to be really quite helpful um, and it shows that just sometimes even when you've got massive misinformation going on and quite deliberate misreporting, you can shift it back. And I'm most grateful to Twee, uh, to the journalists involved who want to do responsible journalism and uh, uh, to Ashley Bloomfield for telling me uh, that it's, it's, it's okay. And you'll see the Mark Bloomfield article is in the chat. Um, this is an ongoing thing for all of us, is dealing with the fact that there are folk around who want to misrepresent what's happening. Let's go, let's see whether we can get Ian Norton uh, to unmute himself. Um, he's in Australia and um, Ian is working uh, with us on many of the issues faced by businesses, by governments and others as they try to come to terms with COVID and get societies and communities COVID ready. Ian, if you felt like it, could you unmute and just tell us where, where you've been really focused in the last couple of weeks and uh, some of the challenges that you're seeing in Australia as people try to come to terms with this virus and, and learn to live with it rather than be scared of it. Over to you, Ian. Thanks, David. Well, um... Yeah. Hi from Queensland. Uh, we, I'm just back here after being down in Victoria in, in Melbourne and, and probably some of you have seen that on the news. I suppose the first update from Australia is that uh, uh, Victoria is still in lockdown um, and the state government there has taken a, a really uh, a, a sort of aggressive stance um, to try and decrease the numbers. They've dropped from 700 a day down to uh, the mid hundreds, so around 45, 50 a day at the moment. Um, I just, you know, the impact has been really bad on the economy, particularly in Victoria and in Melbourne, but, uh, but across the country. Uh, with these heavy lockdowns, they've just been extended for a further two weeks. And I suppose we've got today a, a day called Are You OK Day, um, Mental Health Day. Um, and the, the feedback from, from Melbourne particularly is, is really tragic in, in mental health terms. Um, 
Lifeline, one of our suicide prevention lines, had its heaviest day of calls ever last Tuesday when the extension for a further two weeks was announced. Um, so, uh, so that's a, a microcosm, I suppose. Um, I think there's a, uh, quite a, an interesting approach here in Australia, perhaps different from around the world, uh, really looking at very heavy suppression, if not elimination in some states. Um, and we've got an unfortunate situation where different states, we have eight states and territories here in Australia, and each one are closing their borders to each other um, and acting almost as independent countries in a federation, which we are. Um, and we've had several incidents in the last week or two here where I'm in Queensland, New South Wales, just to the south of us, uh, lots of medical interventions that uh, could have gone well for a community that lived near the border that should normally go to Brisbane have had to fly and wait a long, long time for those flights to get all the way down to Sydney, which is a thousand kilometers away. Uh, and in some cases with tragic results. So um, there's really a lot of uh, difficulty with this, a huge burden on the, on the, on the industrial side, on the, on the business side as well. Um, and it's really starting to, I think it's uh, preferentially affecting uh, those who are the lowest income earners as well. So uh, as, uh, when it comes to business, it's not so much the business owners and the, the larger groups that are suffering. It's, it's the, the smaller businesses and those who are in, uh, you know, in coffee shops or restaurants or in other sectors where, which are all shut at the moment. Uh, so we really uh, feel for them. I suppose the, the only other last thing to say is that if you want to bring it up at the, the meat industry and others, that is really taking off for us here. It's a large sector in Australia. Uh, a lot of questions still coming up about the safety of uh, frozen food um, and, and that transport to China and other big markets. Um, and it affects a lot of particularly low income or first generation immigrant workers here in Australia. So it, it has an impact. Thanks. So this, this uh, Australian COVID is really hitting hard. I, I mean, the things that strike me in that you've said are firstly, uh, that the, the authorities have decided to do really rigorous movement restrictions to try to get on top of things. And um, they're dragging on. And there are a lot of people in, in the affected areas who are on in the uh, um, informal economy. It sounds like they're getting really badly hit. It's a bit similar to what Rojan just described from Nepal. Uh, in addition, this thing about the states being a bit sovereign is quite surprising to, to all of us. I don't think we ever expected that inside Australia, you would get this uh, sort of uh, intensive action at the borders between states. And uh, other colleagues I've had who are living in Western Australia and so on, have said it's really become quite, quite aggressive. Uh, some parts of the country sort of putting barriers and so on and just saying, keep out, we don't want you bringing COVID in. Sounds tough. Uh, and lastly, just your, your point that the small and medium enterprises are taking huge hits. I think this is a global picture. I don't quite know what this is going to do with just large numbers of micro, small and medium enterprises going bust with no capacity for, for, for recovery uh, in the current uh, architecture. We just don't have a clue what this is going to lead to in the medium to long term. Uh, as always, Ian, you know that anything we can do to help. We do get occasional chances to talk on Australian media. You know my message is please try to find ways to get ahead of this virus without imposing lockdowns. I've just been discussing that with the Irish this morning. I've been constant refrain with the UK and it would be my same message as much as possible to Australia. We've got to be able to learn to cope with this and to get ahead of it without the enormous social and economic consequences of lockdown. Ian, I know you're campaigning on this. Are you getting any pickup from, uh, with this message uh, with the people you talk to? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, we, we talked about it on, on a call uh, a few weeks ago uh, when I talked about traffic lights and the illustrator captured that idea. Uh, it's certainly resonating with business, um, this idea that it shouldn't be a black and white, a switch on and switch off. It should be incremental increases and decreases according to the waves. Yeah. Um, yes, it, we, I think we, we will need to, to call on you to, to have a chat um, on, on a larger media scale if I can later on, but uh, we'll, we'll be in touch. Thank you very much, Ian. So that's Ian, somebody that 
uh, uh, Catherine and I have worked with for many years. He's just the most amazing public health guy, uh, led the work on international medical teams and worked very closely with us on Ebola. Thank you, Ian. Thanks for joining from Australia. Rhiannon Osborne, you've been telling us what's been happening in Zambia, and I know that you're keeping in touch. Uh, you're doing lots of other things now. Here you are. Um, Rhiannon, give us, uh, could you unmute and just tell us what you're seeing and hearing, either from the Zambia perspective or from any other geography where you're currently working at the moment? Yeah, so um, I was working with the UK Department for International Development in Zambia for all of 2020, um, except the last two weeks. So I've just come back to the UK um, to restart medical school. And it's actually interesting how many parallels there are between the challenges, especially the kind of more conceptual and attitudinal challenges um, between what was going on in the UK um, and what's going on in Zambia. Um, in Zambia, so for context, August was kind of the peak so far that we know of. Um, and that was where things were really intense. It was mostly confined to the capital, um, except border towns. So border towns were hit really hard because there's a lot of cross-border trade. And it's also really hard when the border was Tanzania because we had no idea what was going on on the other side. Um, so yeah, it was really hard to kind of manage those outbreaks. Um, I think, yeah, I think there are a couple of things to, that would be useful for people on this call to highlight. I think two of the things that are actually the same in Zambia and the UK are like, people do have the capacity to respond and do things and, you know, adapt their lives, but only if you kind of enable them to. Um, it's not, it's not very, I think one of the things we found that was quite difficult in Zambia was that a lot of the time there was kind of an, a patronizing assumption which I think I'll go back to in terms of the relationship between high and low um, income countries where it was assumed that people didn't know what they needed to do um, yeah. actually everyone most people knew what they needed to do they have lots of experience with infectious diseases and like, they have semi-decent access to information in a lot of places um, it was that people were being told to do things they couldn't do like wash your hands every day and don't go to work and those kind of messages because they didn't come with, until quite recently, um, because they didn't come with the factors that enable you to do that, they were just really annoying people, um, which was kind of fair enough. Um, and I think one of the things that's also a, the, another parallel is the economy versus COVID narrative. Yeah. Um, and I think kind of building on what was said about, I think Nepal earlier, was that it's especially hard to avoid that narrative and to have it in a nuanced way when you have a really, um, really prominent informal sector um, yeah. that supports, I think, Zambia, 86% of the population. Um, and I was having some conversations with some of the bigger businesses who yeah. were getting really annoyed with the informal sector because they were saying, oh, you know, the big businesses, we're doing everything we can and the informal sector aren't helping us. So there's also a tension between formal business and informal business. Um, about who's going to get the help and who's going to who's going to you know be supported. Yeah. Um, so I think yeah that narrative really needs to just go away. Um, I think one of the other things I'll, okay I'll do two more things I don't want to do too don't want to talk too much um, was the thing about having things at the local level. It's also incredibly important to have things at kind of the district level in places like Zambia because that's the only place where you're going to have these multi stakeholder meetings and groups that can actually get stuff done on the back of it as well because yeah. i think there's a lot of emphasis on having multi-stakeholder discussion at the national level which is great but at the level where you're getting stuff done you really need everyone together um and you really need to focus on the stuff that allows you to get stuff done like yeah. you know having fuel for contact tracers having enough contact tracers you having you know all of the things um like access and then also i guess that goes to the global level because zambia really struggled to buy reagents um because yeah. we had no purchasing power um, and I think the two things that allow you to kind of do that are data and evidence, especially at the local level, but also data and evidence that's useful, not like in Europe where we're putting restrictions on other countries traveling based on purely their testing, whereas actually it's probably a good thing if they're picking up cases. Good, good, um, good point, good point. Get to your last one now. Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, Okay, and then I would say the narrative that is we're using in Zambia and should be used in the UK, but is not, is being actively pro-poor. So being like, okay, not just saying, okay, the vulnerable are most affected by COVID, which is being said in, most, in both countries, 
um, but in Zambia they're actively saying this is how we're acting on it and this is how it's affecting our programming rather right. than and I haven't got that impression from my brief stint in the UK. Okay, Sorry. could you just restate your last point? I just missed, uh, missed the, the crunch words because of a sound glitch. Just um, Being actively pro-poor, so yeah. recognising that who it affects the most but not stopping there and doing something about it. The reason why I wanted Rhiannon to talk a bit is that she wrote me quite a long piece uh, from Zambia uh, about a month ago after a briefing that I did that she tuned into. And what was really interesting from her observation was exactly what she's just told us now and what you've heard also a bit, listening to Ian, listening to Rojan, actually, the way in which this disease is hitting people doesn't vary hugely in different parts of the world in the sort of macro picture. Of course, micro, it's very different, but it's a disease of poverty. It's hitting the informal sector. It's turning the small and medium enterprises into real trouble. And it's the only responses that make any sense are locally integrated responses. So, Pete, I'm now going to rewind the tape and go to the top uh, and just do my, my comments. Uh, I know you've been leaving a bit of space, but before I do that, uh, absolutely, I do want to go to Karen Kaplan. Now, she may not want to unmute her video. She might explain why. But Karen, how do things look from your perspective where you are? Over to Karen Kaplan. Um, <laughs> you're right. I'm not going to unmute my video. <laughs> um, it's in the middle of the night here on the east coast of the US. Yeah. Um, and I've just traveled back into New York City because today's 9-11. So um, I need to be home for it. So um, as for COVID, um, I just heard today um, for the first time, twindemic. Uh, the pressure to get your flu shot um, is a daily chant across this country now, and they're calling it a twindemic, um, which was a first. Um, I think, uh, unfortunately, um, the communities hit the hardest here in America, Black and uh, Hispanic communities, which had a lot of press coverage, uh, has it started to lessen, and the the, the messaging is, you know, communities of color. Well, specifically, it's black and, and Hispanic. But it's moved on to, because we're in an election cycle where this elephant in the room just sucks up, just unfortunately, sucks up the air um, and changes what we should be talking about every day into just another shocker every minute of every day. And I'm sorry to say that yesterday's revelation from Bob Woodard's book um, that the president of the United States knew full well that the virus was airborne. And there was five times, he actually even knew the figure, had internalized the figure, but it was five times deadlier than the flu and did not put protocols in place to save uh, tens of thousands of lives as we've just passed 191,000 people um, who, souls who have died. But the other quick things I'll just say and stop talking is we don't talk enough about contact tracing anymore because we're sidelined by all this politics every minute of the day. Um, my sister is a school teacher, special ed teacher for third and fourth grade students um, in uh, basically uh, in the slums outside of, of uh, Houston. And they don't have PPE yeah. and the children don't understand when they do, when she does wear a face mask or a shield, yeah. um, you know, the children can't understand what's happening. So I think that's, that's, all, that's my unfortunate, not positive news from, from America. If I had one positive story I would share with you right now, um, is that people do care. We do care for one another. I think we're just very overwhelmed here. That's all. And so, Look forward to the briefing and from hearing from all of you. Aaron, thank you. I mean, I think every single one of us wants to reach out to you and to fellow Americans who are trying to make sense of this and just can't understand how 
something that's endangering the lives of and actually killing so many American people gets somehow sidelined by what you say just now by the political discourse. And then uh, this revelation yesterday, which um, is quite extraordinary that uh, they, the leader knew that this was a really dangerous virus, but somehow decided not to share that with the people because of various uh, anxieties about panic and so on, he says. It's all a bit, it's a bit surreal. And uh, um, Karen, we are so grateful to you for staying up at night to join us and, and thank you for that. So let me now uh, just um, uh, 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 go through um, go through things and just give you my quick resume of where we are, uh, and then we'll go back to the um, to the to the survey and all that. But I I just changed the order around because I wanted to get a flavour of some of you from some of you, and then I can link my comments to what you've said. Yeah, so all around the world, we have the following situation. The virus is advancing. Populations are working out how to reduce the risk by physical distancing, face protections, hygiene, and self-isolation. Public health services are being ramped up as much as possible, but there are shortages of testing capacity that we know very well. And when a country is able to get the numbers down, uh, but through interrupting transmission and popular action, that's great. But case, uh, cases do come back and you get resurgence. And so all over Europe, uh, and that's Western Europe, Central Europe, Eastern Europe, and in Middle East and many other parts of the world where governments felt that they had done really well with their people in getting the cases down, we now have signs of spikes and surges because that virus is still there and it's still coming back. And so we keep uh, advising governments to focus on getting their societies COVID ready. And it's COVID ready means having a state of mind where you are going to hold the virus back. I keep making this gesture with my hands. Hold the virus back. But to, to do that, it requires an incredible partnership between people and authorities. And so I think some of the, you were noting in the chat, thank you, by the way, for using the chat, but also looking around the world, there are communities that think that it's the right thing to do to protest about the restrictions and the behavior changes that are necessary to live with this virus. And, and I think we're all understanding that there is that anger. We're understanding that there is that frustration, that absolute annoyance that businesses are going under all the time. And we've got to somehow tune into that anger and frustration and not present it as being somehow illogical and not to ridicule people who are feeling angry, but to tune into it and work with it. Just like in previous briefings, we've talked about working with the politics because the politics are important. I'm now saying that as the resurgences build up and as it's quite clear that populations are getting really fed up with what this is doing to them, their lives, their communities, those of us who are working on this have got to do what several of you have already talked about, what Rhiannon talked about, what Rojan talked about. We've got to understand just what a terrible hardship this is for so many people and tune into it and not run away from it. We've got to engage in it and feel it and not try to dismiss it. And, you know, when I talked to groups of doctors and nurses, yesterday a seminar with the Royal Society of Medicine in the UK, for example, I'm also adding one extra thing in. This COVID has had a terrible impact on the health workforce. 570,000 health workers in the Americas have been affected by COVID. Two and a half thousand health workers in the Americas have died of COVID. 
And actually every country you go to, the story of health workers being ill and dying or health workers like Paul Garner on the last briefing getting their long COVID, which just really messes up their lives, shows us that, you know, we've got to tune into the frustration of health workers as well. And you've just heard Karen say, more talking about her school teacher sister, often you can't get the protective equipment. So as well as tuning to the frustration of societies, let's also be aware of the extra frustration of health workers, care workers and others who are just feeling sometimes quite neglected and left because they're struggling with trying to keep themselves safe. And then we've got poor countries just spiraling into recession. And uh, the, the recession story is coming from all sorts of different places. I got some new information from Indonesia about households really finding it hard to buy what they need for their food and just feeling poverty like they've not felt before. And I don't now need to go country to country. I actually expect that as we go from country to country, we have more and more evidence of increasing poverty. Yesterday, the person who's responsible for humanitarian action in the UN briefed the Security Council and said, look, the place where this is really hitting the hardest is in humanitarian crises. And he picked up the problems in Syria, the problems in Gaza, the problems in Libya, Sometimes not huge numbers of people with COVID, but the systems just cannot cope. And the uh, Syria story is also one, unfortunately, of quite a lot of UN staff also with COVID, some of whom have to be evacuated out because they get really super ill. So I think I want to, you to hold these two things. The recession is biting and it's hitting poor people all over the world and the humanitarian situation is also bad. And you know, you think, sometimes you think, is any sector being spared? I looked at shipping. The maximum duration, legal duration, of a sailor's contract is 11 months. Basically, that's designed to try to mean that sailors can get home to their families once a year. There are 250,000 sailors stuck at sea on boats beyond their contracts because they are not able to land, because ports are not allowing them to land because of fears of COVID. That's from the International Maritime Organization. Actually, I knew that statistic. It's been in the back of my mind, but it just came back to me. And so, you know, there's another sector where poor people again are being badly hit. And you just have to add that to the hospitality sector, to the airline sector, where again, low paid staff are being laid off. And we just are reminded that this poverty impact of COVID is everywhere. It's not just one place or the other, it's right across the waterfront. And then we go to the domestic situation. The program Women Deliver has just released a collection of statistics about what's happening with women around the world in terms of employment, in terms of access to food and nutrition, in terms of violence, in terms of access to reproductive health services and abortions and all other necessities for life. And saying that actually, as one might have predicted, this crisis is just turning the screw that squeezes uh, some of the um, benefits and advantages and opportunities that women have been winning over the last few decades. It squeezes them out and it's made life really, really difficult for hundreds of millions of women all over the world. And then children. Rojan pointed out that children are coming out of school and they're helping in the home uh, and and we, we've seen that in all over the world, there's been a huge reduction in kids going to school, particularly girls. And we've also seen how schools themselves are finding it hard to reopen. Cuba schools have had to close. Spain 
there's been closures. France is having struggles with schools. Bahrain had struggles with its schools. And again, what I'm trying to say to you in these briefings is that I give you little snippets and snapshots from around the world, but this is a global pattern. And so we come to perhaps the, the part that really troubles me the most, something that Karen was referring to. This is a global emergency. It's a catastrophe that's unfolding in front of our eyes of extraordinary proportions. And world leaders need to focus on it collectively. I've said this now for six months and I've been pushing it hard, but I've got strong on it again because I'm getting more and more evidence that where communications at the top of a country, at the top of a business, or at the top of a local authority where communications are properly consistent and the message is managed, then things go well. But where the communications are muddled, inconsistent, or chopping around all the time, and people just don't know what's going on, there is a major problem of mistrust, and there's a major problem of people not knowing what to do. And we've had this coming through as a result of the lurching around in some quite well-known government policies. And I want to really advocate for us and beyond us everywhere for consistent communication from leaders, because right now, with these very difficult situations happening everywhere and governments trying to work out how to deal with resurgence and so on, with health workers in such difficulty, we need the communications to be consistent, solid and not changing. And then finally, if I was to give one message to world leaders about the way forward and getting COVID ready, I would say, Again, what I've been hearing from you, and we heard it from Ian just now, get that local level action properly coordinated, organized, integrated, and managed. Uh, with John, we have been, John who's uh, uh, with us and his things, I'll ask John to say something in a minute. What we've been doing is working with local authorities in different parts of the world and just helping them to understand that perhaps the most precious part of local integration is investing in ways to get the different actors to work effectively at interfaces and not to squabble with each other. Where Ian is, we know that there have been issues between the federal administration in Canberra and the state and territorial administrations around the country. And in other parts of the world, we've also seen this squabbling between different administrations difficult. So we're saying invest in collective integrated working and try to make sure that you minimize those interface battles that are so common, whilst at the same time focusing on the interests of poor people. John, uh, you won't want to say a word. If Holly is still on, I saw her just now, she might want to say a word. How can we get this locally integrated responding to become the norm rather than the exception around the world? Well, thanks for the easy question, uh, David. It, 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 it's, not a, it's not a straightforward thing. And it, it differs, of course, place by place because places are different. And I think that takes me to understand the outbreak, understand what's going on, understand where the virus is and then rather than think of it as what's the relationship between national and local or national and regional depending on on, on the country and where resources sit there's a third player in it that's absolutely critical and that's the people who live there start with the people who live there understand what they want what they need the way that their lives work, whether you reach them best through the schools or whether you reach them best through the mosques or whether you reach them best through the church, it's, it, it, it's different in every single place. Because what helps um, suppress outbreaks is population behavior being different. Yeah. And once people understand what they need to do uh, and have a collective sense of risk and how best to manage it, whether that's through distancing or mask wearing or practices of work, 
um, then we can get on top of it. So it's all too easy to think about what do we as the authorities need to do, uh, but we need to do this with people. We've always said that the virus is the problem and humanity is the answer. Thank you very much, John. I'm going to go to Holly if she wants, then to Anne Hendricks Jenkins. I want to try to develop as much as you can what are the, the tools that we can use to stimulate coordinated local level action to help communities get on top of this? And what is the communication support and the administrative support that's necessary to make this happen? Holly, did you want to say anything about this? Or is this giving, am I putting you on the spot? <laughs> Morning, everybody. Uh, slightly on the spot in that I'm uh, just taking my son to school. But my main thought in response to what you and John have said is that uh, it's really about starting where people are. So you have to find out what local people really care about and what's important to them to enable their choices to be different. So I, I think that certainly, for example, one of the places I'm working with, the people that are keen to do something different and, and care about this are people who are really interested in sport. And so the conversations that we've been having with them is, okay, so what, what are the things that motivate you and are important? So that that's, would be an example of where I think you start where they are. Thanks very much indeed. Starting where people are, tuning into what gets them excited and interested, and then helping them to be able to make the choices that will help them to be healthier. Very much in tune with what Rhiannon was observing when she wrote to me from Zambia. And Anne Hendricks Jenkins, I know that you've been looking at this quite carefully. Do you want to just help us to develop our thinking on this particular issue? Thank you so much, I appreciate it. Um, as a person who facilitates 11 uh, chapters of the Movement for Community Development across Africa, <clears throat> I'd just like to emphasize <clears throat> that there are so many local leaders out there, informal local leaders who are passionate, who are committed, who are volunteering. I get emails and connected from people every day and I can't possibly respond to all of them. We just had a group of 15 slum dwellers in Liberia meet and form a chapter on their own volition and they're bursting with ideas and potential and um, experience and commitment. And it's so hard to get any resources to them, to get them the technical support is even more than resources. A lot of times they need technical support and to get them visibility. So we find that by um, helping them form groups and coalitions that can really help them get the visibility and also uh, hone their ideas and uh, learn from each other as peers. But I, I love your integrated local action um, message because uh, there, it's just so much untapped potential out there. And we have a lot of practical ways where we try and bring people together and get them the attention that they need and the technical support that they need in order to respond exactly to what they see in their own homes and in their own neighborhoods far better than anyone ever else could. So if we could harness that local leadership uh, better and more systematically, uh, I think it could uh, produce huge results uh, for a relatively small input. But Anne, thank you so much. The absolutely massive, uh, invaluable nature of local cooperation just being brought out. And thank you for the Liberia example. Some people on this call know that I, I have some such precious memories of communities in Liberia just taking over the Ebola response in 2014 and showing that if they were given the opportunity to do it, not lots of resources, they could get on and do it and do it well and actually reduce the threat of Ebola. And it just transformed the country from being utterly overwhelmed by this disease, three months later, really beginning to push the virus back through integrated local action. Supported David, by let me say, I'm going to tell our group in Liberia that you said that, and that is going to mean so much to them. So thank you um, so much for that recognition. And do you know, the, the other part of the story, you may not want to tell them this, 
is that I was working a lot with the Liberian president, uh, uh, President uh, Johnson Sirleaf, and um, uh, one day she was really fed up uh, and she said, I just, I think the whole world's forgotten us and we're just being left here to die because this was a bad moment when a lot of people were dying in the streets. And then I met her a few days later and she was all smiling and I said, gosh, something good must have happened. She said, I just had this call from President Obama and he just said the following words. We have not forgotten the people of Liberia. We're standing with you. And she said, I didn't need anything else. I just said, thank you, Mr. President, put the phone down. And uh, then I called all the deputies from around the country and I got them together. And I said, look, I've just been given this message from President Obama. And she said, just simply that sign of support was so, so valuable. It meant that people felt they could pick themselves up and find their way. So I really, really agree with this, that sometimes just simply recognizing the brilliance of local people when they organize uh, and getting a, 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 a well-known figure to really support it makes such a difference. Afterwards, of course, he sent the troops. But interesting, <laughs> it actually dealt with the problem before the troops came. It was just beautiful and an example of the power of local organization. So great, thank you, Anne. And thank you. Uh, 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 Joseph, uh, I, I can't, I got to ask you to come in now. I don't know whether you can turn your video on. So Joseph is in the Philippines and we've known that it's been a big struggle in the Philippines to get on top of this virus. And there have been quite a lot of challenges as well, including health workers who face difficulty. Joseph, I don't know how much you're plugged into things right now. What's your quick report from uh, Manila or beyond? Uh, well, uh, it's not under control. Uh, the first part of the response, it's now been six months, 180 days since the uh, lockdown. So yeah. six months. So they were doing a lot of the uh, uh, social distancing, uh, locking everybody down without the testing. Yeah. So that's the problem. So the gap was on the testing. So they don't know uh, where the virus is. Yeah. So now we have this spread all over the archipelago uh, from the original uh, containment supposed to be in Metro Manila. And then now uh, the easing of the lockdown, everybody went to the provinces. There's no economic activity. We contracted by 16.5%. Yeah. Uh, we are in a depression right now. Uh, so... Uh, it's getting bad. Uh, the, I, I think this is a natural experiment. <laughs> That's what they're going to do. <laughs> well, that's one way of putting it, Joseph. I just hope, I'm thinking of you all the time when I read the statistics from Philippines and I think, gosh, you. I hope you're doing all right on food and other essentials. And I know that you're also a bit worried about getting the virus for the same reason as me. So, um, yes. <laughs> Stay strong, stay strong. And uh, I mean, it, it, it is a problem. You know, you do a lockdown and it freezes the virus in place. And then you have to release the lockdown because people just need to get money and they need food. But as you release the lockdown, people move around and the virus moves. And so you're, in a, you're very stuck. I think the situation in the Philippines, situation in Nepal, situation in Bangladesh, another country I'm working closely with, really really tough for governments to find the right balance and uh, as as Rhiannon said the economy versus uh, health uh, trade-off does start to become very very uh, real and difficult when you're looking at the informal sector and uh, there the choices are stark I don't one more thing uh, go on uh, one more thing uh, the leadership because uh, there are some local government who thinks the virus is just a regular fever. So they're not doing anything. So that's the problem. The leadership is uh, if they understand that it is just an ordinary sickness, yeah. then there's no testing. There's no, there's nothing. It's just a natural experiment. Yeah, well, that's that we've seen one or two countries and one or two leaders saying that they just want to do that. Uh, I have to tell you that, uh, uh, I mean, unless I'm completely wrong, this is a pretty dangerous natural experiment, Joseph. It's not something that I would want happening in my local community. I do think 
that societies have to focus on holding this virus back. I think just saying we'll let it go, eh, it's not going to not going to be good, uh, really, because there'll just be a lot of excess death. Uh, Yusuf is in his, Israel. Uh, I, I, I think you're still there, Yusuf. And, and we've been looking at some of the challenges in Israel with getting local action in place, some of the disputes between the central government and local government not been easy. I mean, partly because the politics in your country are not straightforward. How does it look today, Yusuf? Good morning, everyone. Um, the situation is distressing um, because uh, the first uh, wave was uh, quite well managed. The second wave, which has been building since July, has now reached uh, has now gone beyond all proportions. And uh, the health system, especially in the north of the country, the hospitals are nearing a point of saturation. Now, uh, it took forever for the politicians to appoint a professional um, public health and uh, medical doctor uh, as the director of the crisis. And he proposed uh, 10 days ago a system called, um, I guess it would be the stoplight system, red cities, yellow cities, and green cities, according to um, the incidence of infectiousness. Now, I have to also preface what I'm saying in that we have at the present time the highest, one of the highest incidences of infectiousness in the world and perhaps the lowest incidence of mortality. Yeah. And it's because our doctors are managing the crisis once it gets to them uh, in an exceedingly expert manner. Yeah. However, uh, this, uh, you know, we say that COVID is a disease of poverty, and that is certainly true. It yeah. is also a disease of maldevelopment globally. And we're seeing one of the sy symptoms um, is that it, it is a disease that produces decisiveness. Decisiveness because of the ferocity of the virus and decisiveness because we uh, people don't know what to do. Now, the figures that I'm seeing this morning show that a 6% infectious rate in um, the general population, but there are two sectors and uh, one is ethnic and one is religious that have not been cooperating. And the infectious rate there uh, in those two places is close to double or more than what it is in the general population. Now, it was a very, very small country. It wouldn't qualify to be a district in some countries yeah. of the world. And the whole idea of being able to call local uh, lockdowns is is unenforceable because uh, we live in very close proximity, yeah. very close proximity. And so um, the whole idea of the uh, stoplight uh, system could work, I think, in other places, uh, but it can't work here. And now uh, we are, will be going into our second full national lockdown, it appears, as of a cabinet ministry meeting last night. Yeah. Next week, on the eve of the Jewish New Year, for at least two weeks, and that is particularly dispiriting um, for the Jewish population because we were also in lockdown for the spring holidays. Yeah. Um, and so, again, divisiveness at a time that we're interconnected and a lack of, of, uh, of trust in the authorities, not the medical authorities, the leadership. Yusuf, thank you. I mean, this point that if, you, if you're not careful, the communication lapses and perhaps uh, indecision can erode trust between government and people might be one of the most important things we're seeing all over the world. Absolutely. Limit. Yusuf, I think, to the amount that people can just cope with what they perceive to be uh, slightly um, arbitrary decisions. And uh, 
this phenomenon you've just mentioned, I, I suspect is quite widespread. And it's going to cause some, some pretty major challenges in the coming months. Uh, please stay tuned, everybody, to this question of trust. Remember what Anne Hendricks Jenkins said about the power of local actors. And pick, remember the theme that we've had running right through this discussion today, which is local organization matters if you can get it organized. Think to what Yusuf said that it's tough to do that in a small country where people are very interconnected. Bear in mind always that this is a phenomenon that hits poor people harder. And it does mean that we've got lots of different issues to bear in mind. It can seem horrendously confusing. I know it's a natural experiment, but it can also seem to be a pretty confusing one. And that takes us back to one of our underlying themes in these briefings, which is when stuff is complex, because things are very interrelated, we need to take what we call a living systems perspective on them. Systems because it is multiple interacting processes that we have to deal with, with our eyes open and without being scared. And living systems because these interacting processes all involve people interacting together with very different identities and very different uh, sort of reasons and motivations for their lives. Also with very different relationships between each other. They don't always share information openly. And part of what we're trying to do in encouraging these locally led responses is to create an identity that everybody's working together to put people first, as John said, to create the relationships that Ian Norton was talking about to try to reduce the tensions at interfaces. And as several of you have been sharing, to share information as openly as possible. And that combination of the identity, the relationships and information sharing, according to us at least, contributes to trust. But if those things get broken, trust gets broken, and it's really hard to recreate trust. It's not something we can just press a button. And so final words, there are merits people on today who I don't know, I must, I must admit, you know, uh, uh, or perhaps I know you and um, uh, uh, I've misunderstood because of the names. Don't hesitate in future briefings just to drop a note in the chat and we'll bring you in. But before we close, so just go back to John and just ask him to reflect on why this focus uh, on what really matters to people is going to be important for trust and why without trust this is going to be an even tougher battle than it already is. John please. In the end <clears throat> I think what what gets us on top in this is everybody around us, people who live near us, uh, people who live in our cities in our countrysides, doing more sensible things to limit the spread of, of the disease and they'll do that when they have information that they understand and make sense to them and a way of um, working out what that means they should do. And where we don't have that, where our information flips and flops, where we don't get good information at all, people will make stuff up to try, to try and make sense of what's going on. And when we do that, we start to lose control of what populations are doing. We start to get populations behaving in ways that encourage disease rather than uh, limit it. We start to get work practices showing up that are, that are so unhelpful and um, it's therefore really really important that we get people good quality information and a good commentary alongside it which means they can make sense for themselves and do what's best for themselves and their families. John thank you. I think everybody who's been coming to these briefings quite often can really tune in to those wise words. Information to help sense-making, sense-making to help 
the kinds of decisions that will keep people healthy. And then at the theme that's come through today is this thing is grinding into the lives of poor people in a most horrendous, horrendous fashion. And we have to keep it up and we have to keep spreading the word that local level action that is designed to reinforce trust is the key to moving forward. Uh, I'd, before we close, I'd like to go to Twee, who might have some comments to everybody. Uh, Twee then would take us to Peter Morey, and then we will close. Uh, Twee, also, could you just say a word or two about the LinkedIn group after you've given us the, the poll results? Twee. Absolutely. So I'm just posting a message in the chat now. Uh, we do have a private chat group on LinkedIn where we can keep building our connections and, and sharing information with one another. So please do send me a request there. I'm sharing the poll results with you now. So it's always nice to see we have people joining uh, in particular from East Asia and Pacific region because uh, that's why we hold these sessions on Friday mornings to reach you there. Age range, always good to see we have representatives from every age range, even three under 30 today. And then uh, for how we're feeling today, uh, good to see, mostly positive. Um, I saw quite a few comments in the chat around the importance of mental health. And I think uh, when we talk about local level action and leadership, um, me personally, I, I'm a big fan of local level leaders. They have a lot more empathy. They understand the mental health um, and well-being of people in their communities much better. Um, so, yes, yeah, so, so good to see that. Please talk to one another, talk about how you're feeling, and join us in that private chat group so you can share there as well. Uh, I'll spotlight now Peter Morey's drawing here. And back to you, David. Well, Peter, you've done it again. And, and I watched you doing it just out the corner of my eye. You, your pieces of the jigsaw, uh, getting them in place, it's been quite difficult. Peter, what did you feel while you were doing this? Did you feel that we created a really tough job for you by the shifting the, the structure around a bit, or was it okay in the end? No, it was, it was okay. Um, I was able to move the, the beginning bit to the bottom and show the jigsaw pieces, so I'm building into the the picture that you came that you circled back round to so I think it worked quite nicely um, uh, as a sort of visual metaphor uh, an overall visual metaphor in the end so you can see at the bottom there's a snapshot of some of the comments at the beginning um, from, from local lo uh, local um, uh, lo local snapshots <laughs> and then I tried to circle back to this focus on local action at the top left so I hope it's readable and I hope it's got a really strong focus on people and situations well, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, I want to just tell everybody, I like Peter's use of the jigsaw puzzle pieces as a way of showing that we're trying to fit together elements of systems and to really address complexity. I like to, the use of the pink bubbles bottom right as a way of helping us bring in some of your vignettes and also the use of, of of the banners and the, and the bullets for bringing out headlines. Everybody do take these uh, visual scribes of our briefings off the website of 4SD. We think they're providing a most beautiful record. We're super grateful to everybody who's involved. Uh, on behalf of all of us in the 4SD team who get such a lot of joy interacting with all of you, we will go on and uh, inshallah we will be with you again to continue the discussion next Tuesday uh, for, at 5.30 p.m. European time and then next Friday at 8.30 a.m. European time. Meanwhile, keep talking, keep act, being active and remember that this network that we have has power and potential that we can't possibly tell at this time. We're not many, but we connect broadly with loads of others. And it's through networking that we can stimulate local level action and trust that we've all agreed is so important. So bye bye all. And just before we completely go, I just saw that uh, there's somebody joined with a computer saying Christian Forsett. 
So if that is a faucet on, if we can just get the gallery view back on, uh, we can just see who's behind the camera there. Thank you. There we are. 